So we are wrapping up today our series that we started kind of following the Christmas season called When We Gather. And if you remember, we started this series kind of by saying that Christ's presence is powerful in our lives as individuals. And we celebrated that at Christmas time. That's what it, it means is that Jesus is our Emmanuel, that God left heaven. He knows you and he desires to be in your life and to know you individually and personally. But we believe that there is something as great as it is when God knows you individually, that when we gather together with others in his name, there's something even more powerful that God wants to do through all of us than just in my life individually. When we started out this series uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, and it was reminding us of the priority of gathering together. And the author was writing saying, don't give up getting together. There was that temptation in the early church. And he said, get together. It is important. It matters when you gather together with one another. We've been talking about some of the things that we do when we do that. What happens when we gather? Why do we gather? Why is it so important for us? We started by saying one of the things that we do when we gather is what happens below us. And so we're kicking off this morning, as Christia already mentioned, our Discovery Land program. And we have this opportunity when we gather to mean something to one another's families and lives, to minister to children, to love on them, to draw our hearts close to what Jesus' heart was close to. And statistically, our children's ministry is one of the most effective means of reaching our community with the gospel of Christ. We talked about the fact that each one of us is created with kind of this God-shaped hole. And only God can fill this hole in our hearts as much as we chase after other things. Only God can fill this hole in our hearts. But there's also a U-shaped hole in the kingdom of God. And that God has created you uniquely and specifically to be you. And to plug into the kingdom of God. And you only really get that opportunity when you gather together with the body of believers to live out how God has created you to be. We talked about the power of prayer and how prayer is our opportunity to express our heart to God, to connect with his presence and align our hearts with his, and to do spiritual battle. And that when one of us plugs into God, it's like a single lamp and it shines brightly and God's power can flow through us. But when all kinds of us start gathering together and plugging in our lives to God, that it kind of amplifies, it turns up the light, it helps us be even more aware of the power and the presence of God flowing in and through us. We talked about the opportunity that we have to give to the Lord and that God gives us individually the opportunity to go out and to, to make some kind of an income and a living and that we have this opportunity to tangibly bring that back and say to God, I love you and I trust you and that we pile together the gifts that we bring to God and that he blesses our lives individually, but then he takes that gift and he expands his kingdom with it. And we talked last week about worship through song. And how it has the power to affect every part of our being, our mind, our emotions, and our soul. This morning, I want to take a look at what happened when the very first Christians gathered together. What happened when the very first Christians gathered together? You would probably remember uh, we hit this passage back in Acts when we were doing that series this fall. But when the first Christians gathered together, it says they devoted themselves, Acts chapter 242, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved." This group of people, when they gather together, they are devoted to one another in four specific ways. They devote to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to the fellowship, and to prayer. And I want to look this morning at two of those elements that I think have been very closely related to one another. They're two methods of worship that really can only happen when we gather together. Fellowship and breaking of bread. You know, it's possible to do a lot of things that we do in the church on your own, right? It's possible to, to read the Bible on your own. It's possible to, to pray on your own. It's possible to be in your car jamming out to some worship music and singing songs of praise to God 
on your own. It's possible some people have told me they love to sit out on a lake or sit by the mountainside or, or go to the ocean and sit on the beach and to just connect with God's spirit in nature as they watch the handiwork of God. And you can do that on your own if you want to. But there are two things we cannot experience on our own. The fellowship and the breaking of bread together unless we gather together with other believers. You know, many of us automatically tie the idea of fellowship with eating. We, we have churchy language like we're going to meet in the fellowship hall or, or there's a fellowship dinner. And some of this language, we've kind of automatically tied fellowship with, with eating and, and with meals. In fact, there was a kindergarten teacher who gave her class a show and tell assignment. She said, bring something in that represents your religion. And so the first little boy got up and he said, I am Benjamin and I am Jewish and, and this is the star of David. And he talked a little bit about what that meant to him. And the next little girl got up and she said, I am Mary and I am Catholic and, and this is a rosary. And she talked a little bit about what that meant to her. And the last little boy got up and he said, I am Charles and I am a Wesleyan and this is a casserole. <laughs> Food could be a part of fellowship, but just like worship is more than singing, fellowship is, is more than just eating. The word fellowship comes to us from the Greek word koinonia, which comes from the root word koinos, which means common. Koinonia, say koinonia with me this morning. There's your Greek. So you feel really famous. That's what the, the word fellowship, when you read that in Acts chapter 2, the word that actually was there was the word koinonias comes from the root word koinos, which means common. It's to share something in common. And the same word koinonia is translated in the New Testament other places as partnership or participation or sharing. And this word could easily be eating together. That's something that happens because when we gather together and we eat, we share a meal in common with one another. But fellowship is also a deeper participation with the lives of one another. The first Christians, we're told, when they gathered together, shared everything with one another. They gave up time to be with each other every day. They gave up their financial and material resources to help one another. And there's an element of fellowship that seems to entail giving our time in order to be together and also giving out of what we would naturally hold on to. And that when we spend time in fellowship, it builds a bond or it builds a connection between us. In fact, I might define fellowship for you simply as saying intentional connections with one another. Intentional connections. Anything you do to intentionally connect with other Christians. So look around the sanctuary this morning. I'm not that beautiful. Y'all are. Look at each other. Fellowship is what we do to intentionally connect with one another, to say, I want to give up some time to do something intentionally so that you and I can be in connection, in common, linked together, connected somehow. And that's what fellowship means. For most of us who have been around church for most of our lives, when we hear the phrase breaking bread, we tend to think of the ritual sacrament of communion. During the communion ritual, we break bread as a way of signifying the body of Christ that was crucified and given as a, a penalty for our sin. For Wesleyans, we see communion as a sacrament. It's an outward sign of an inward grace. There's something that we can do out here in the physical realm that signifies something that's going on in here in my heart and in my soul. Wesley called it a, a means of grace. It was an ordinary channel by which God used to change people. There was something about this meal that we share called communion where God's grace is communicated to my life in a way that is unique from other activities I do. Paul defined communion this way in his letter to the church in Corinth. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is a way to physically connect our lives with the death of Jesus Christ and to be reminded of his work for us. It's something we do tangibly in the physical realm to experience what God wants to do in our lives. And some 50 cent theological words that are going on in this justification. We remember that Jesus' death on the cross paid the penalty for our sin so that we would be justified. And that when God looks at our lives, he doesn't see our sin, but he sees us just as if we'd never sinned at all. We are justified before God. It is in the act of Christ giving his life that we are redeemed and we find redemption. Just as if you took money to the store and you would redeem items from the store, you would buy those items from the store so they no longer belong to the store, they belong to you. Jesus, with his life on the cross, bought your life to say your life no longer belongs to you, but God has bought it back. And we believe that it signifies our sanctification. The removing of the impurity of our sin. That Jesus' blood does something in our heart, in our soul, in our life that removes the impurity of the sin in our life. And we celebrate in communion these big fancy 50 cent theological words. We are justified. We are redeemed. We are sanctified. Our sin is covered. We are bought back and owned by God. And the impurity in our life is cleaned up. While we don't believe that the elements physically transform into the literal body and blood of Christ, as the Catholic Church has historically taught, we believe that the power of God is present. That the power of God is communicated in this meal in a way that is unique. The word communion comes from the Latin word communis, which means common. It's a ritual where we share that we have something in common with Christ, that we are taking something in, in place with Christ. As Christ dies on the cross for us, we, as we take communion, remember that we are dying to our sin. That as Christ redeemed us, he buys us back, and our life no longer belongs to us, it belongs to God. And we are connected and share a common relationship. That just as Christ is pure and holy, we share in common a cleansed heart through the sanctifying work of his life. You notice anything interesting about the words fellowship and communion? They're the same word. <laughs> communion is Latin, koinonia is Greek, but they're the same word. They, they both mean common. What we have in common, or we could say our connections within the church, are of extreme importance. There's something related about this communion meal, our connection with Christ, and our fellowship and our connection with one another. So much so that the first church was devoted to these connections. We are created for connection. As a human being sitting here today, you were created for connection. We were created in the image of God for a relationship or a connection with God himself. The reason you were made is because God wanted to know you and be known by you. To have a relationship and a connection with you. And I think, I think most of us get that. But we were also created for connections with each other. As much of the Christian life as you might be able to live out individually on your own, God didn't create you that way. He didn't create you to live your life alone, but to be in community, connection, partnership, fellowship with other Christians. In the very beginning... The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. If you remember the creation story, God creates light and it's good. And God separates the, the land from the waters and it's good. And he creates vegetation and it's good. And he creates animals and it's good. And everything that God creates is good until God creates man in his own image. And he sees that the man is alone. And for the very first time in the creation story, God looks and he says, this ain't good. Adam is in perfect relationship with God. This verse comes before the fall. There is no sin. There is nothing wrong about Adam's connection with God. It is flawless. But Adam look, our God looks at Adam. He says, this ain't good for this bro to be by himself. He needs some help. 
God looks at your life. He says, it's not good to be alone. I created people for more than this. Part of the reason, I think, is that God himself exists in community. We don't have uh, all the time in the world this morning to unpack the entire theology of the Trinity, but we are designed to be in connection with others in part because we are designed with the Imago Dei, the image of God who is in community. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, if we backed up one chapter, it said, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, and God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. There was something about this creation of man that God made with the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, this three in oneness of community that is God. And when he made human beings in his image, he said, I made them like me to be in community. That there's this need for connection in the way that I made them. We are created for connection. And there are times when health or age or circumstances prevent us from being able to be together. And you have to believe and know that God's grace is with us and that God still desires to minister to our lives and to grow us on our journey. But you were created. You were designed from the very beginning of time to be in connection to be in community with God and with one another. Truth is, the problem is, is that sin severs connection. Sin, the things that I do wrong, the things where I mess up, the things where I blow it, the things where my life doesn't quite match the purity and holiness of God, severs the connection. It severs my connection with others. It makes me hide, makes me feel guilty, makes me do stupid things with others. And it severs the relationships I have with others. We know fundamentally, theologically, sin severs our relationship with God. Adam and Eve's actions of sin created a separation, a break in the relationship they had with God. And when they did, if you read the Genesis story, their relationship with one another was changed. At the moment they fell, at the moment they separated from God, the connection they had with one another also separated. It was changed and it was impacted. We know as we read scripture that when God freed his people from Egyptian captivity through Moses, he blessed his people with something called the law. And the law was a way that people could know, how do I please God? How do I connect with God? How do I come back into a relationship with God? And as part of the law, there was a system created where God would receive the sacrifices of his people's livestock and their crops. And the death of livestock was considered by the law to be a substitute for the person offering it to make restitution for their sin and impurity. They could bring livestock. And though the wages of sin for them was death, they could bring livestock to God and they could allow that to die. And God would allow that animal to be a sacrifice, a substitute for the penalty of sin they owed. And while the law created a way for God's people to seek grace and forgiveness from the Lord, animal sacrifices were an imperfect substitute for human sin. They were powerless to remove sin from the heart of God's people. Meaning that while animal sacrifices could pay the penalty of sin, they held no power to change the heart. Thus under the old covenant, God offered grace so that people could be forgiven of sin. But under the law, they were still bound to a position of the heart that desired sin over God. They had a way to say, I know what God wants. I know what God desires for my life. Through the law, I know what it takes to please God. It takes all of these things that I should do and all of these things that I shouldn't do. But as I journey through life, I realize that sometimes I blow it and I mess up on some of these areas and that rightfully, I ought to die for what I've done. But rather than me die, God will take the sacrifices I give back to him and say, God, I love you still. I, want, I, want, I don't want this to be my life. Will you forgive me? And that God would accept that sacrifice in a human being's place. But the problem was, even after that sacrifice, human hearts still desired what human hearts have always desired. Myself, me, my way, namely sin. And sin continued to separate God's people from their heavenly father, 
and cause a rift in the relationship and connection we were created for. The really good news is Jesus' death removes our sin. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to open it to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We started in this passage and we're going to finish this series in this passage. And I'm going to warn you up front, this is a little bit lengthy, a little bit heady, but hang with me. I think this is extremely, extremely important if we can get this. Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 1. It says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that were coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, and no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, Jesus said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you didn't desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I've come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices that never take away sin. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool for by one sacrifice, Jesus has made perfect forever those being made holy. The Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. He says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. What the law could not do, Jesus himself did do. Jesus' death on the cross was a substitute for our own sin. But unlike animal sacrifice, Jesus was fully God and fully human. He was a perfect sacrifice once for all. And while animal sacrifices forgave sin but didn't cleanse the heart, Jesus' death had the power to cleanse our heart. Jesus' death had the power not just to justify but to sanctify. Not just to say, I will forgive what you've done so that we can move on, but to say, I will fundamentally change your nature. I will take the heart that you have and I will clean it so that what you once were is gone, but you are a completely new creation through the power of Jesus Christ. His death not only covers your sin, it sanctifies your heart so that the direction your life is headed is no longer for me, no longer self-serving, no longer desiring my sin in my way, but it is saying, I live for my God. My heart has been forgiven, redeemed, and sanctified through the power of Jesus Christ. doesn't mean that you live a flawless life, but it means that your life is no longer guarded or guided by you. Your life is guided and governed by the power of God through his Holy Spirit in your life. He writes his laws on your hearts and puts his spirit within you. Communion is powerful. It allows us to share in Christ's death, to seek repentance and to be brought into connection with the presence of God in our lives. We share in communion a common death to sin and a common presence of God in our lives as we partake in the sacrament. And this also has a profound impact on human fellowship. Just as communion reminds us of our common death to sin and subsequent connection to God, our fellowship with each other allows us to share a common experience. There's a lot of things that people share in common in humanity. And oftentimes, 
We share a lot of the same difficulties in life. We share struggles in life. We have things that are going on at work, things that are happening with our kids, things we're trying to figure out, how to take care of our parents, how to, to be a better spouse, how to worry about our finances. We struggle as human beings with temptations, with addictions, with anger, with lust, and with bitterness. We experience pain in this life with our health and our personal failure being attacked spiritually. But our fellowship with one another gives us the opportunity to talk about these issues, to share these issues in common with one another, to look at one another and to say, this is what's going on in my life. But fellowship is deeper for a Christian because we not only have the ability to empathize and to share stories of how sin and pain and difficulty and struggle has affected our life, that's what you'd get with secular counseling, empathy. Oh, I understand, that really hurts. But for those who have been saved, who have the presence of the Holy Spirit, we have the power of God to impact one another. Let's read the passage we started out this whole series with. It starts at Hebrews 10, 19, if you still have your finger in Hebrews 10. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, he opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we professed. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we gather together. And there is something important about our gathering because as much as we can connect with God through scripture or through song or through prayer and service and meditation, there's so many things that we could do on our own. There is one thing we can never do on our own. We can never experience the power of fellowship. We can never feel the move of the Holy Spirit through one another's life to mean something to impact our lives. We need each other. God has designed us from the very beginning to need one another. And for those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, this is even more true. And that's why I've said before and will say again, one of the most important things that happens when we gather happens before 10 a.m., and happens after 11.15. What happens in this service is important. But what happens before the service time and after the service time is at least as, if not more, important. If you come late, if you leave early, if you duck your head and you're afraid to talk to anybody, you're missing out on one of the most important things that God wants to do when we gather. He wants to change your life, fundamentally change the position of your heart, wash the impurity of who you are so that God himself takes residence in your life. Remember, we talked about this in Acts, we talked about this in, in Hebrews, but God used to be confined to the inner sanctuary of the temple, and he doesn't live there anymore. Amen. God doesn't live in our church. He washes your life so that his spirit and his power and his presence is in you. And so that if we want to get close to God, we've got to get close to Christians. We've got to get close to people whose lives have been justified, redeemed, and sanctified, who have the power of God to mean something to my life, so that as I connect with each other, I am brought closer into the relationship with God I was created for. The breaking of bread, the connection with God, is so closely linked to the fellowship and the connection with one another. Because as God washes my heart, and as God washes your heart, and as we connect together, we bring each other into the presence of God at work in our lives. And we have the ability, as we talk about what we have in common, our pains, our difficulties, our struggles, our temptations. And as we would open up to one another and say, this is what I'm going through. 
the Holy Spirit at work in another person's life has the literal power of God to impact our lives and move us closer to Jesus. May we be a church that connects with one another. May we not be afraid to share our common experiences of pain and difficulty. May we be a church that talks to one another, that's open with one another, that will pray with one another, for one another, listen to each other. May we be a church that will not forsake gathering together, but will instill the courage of the power of God in one another to keep going, to keep fighting the good fight, to keep believing that we serve a great God who is a good father who desires to do something in your life and build his kingdom in this world and for the next. We were created for connection. Correct? Connections with God and connections to each other. Jesus' death paved the way for God's presence in our lives. This changes everything about how we live and do life. The Holy Spirit within us paves the way for us to experience the presence of God in our relationships with one another. This changes everything about what it means when we gather. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you that he chooses broken, lost sinners like me. And he says, I desire you. I thank you, God, that you loved me so much that you would die in my place. I thank you for the power of Jesus that not only forgives sin, but can change the position of my heart. I thank you for a church where when we come and we gather, we can talk and we can share in common what is going on in our lives, that your presence at work in each one of us individually can impact, can change, can give us courage, can bring the presence of God into one another's lives, that we can be drawn closer to you as we move closer to one another. God, may we experience your power the connection with Christ, and a connection with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. We have the opportunity